Fitz law can be used to figure out how long it takes to select targets, but the original study has only considered one-dimensional targets. So the movement only happened along one dimension, and so the size of the target was only considered one-dimensional. What we will look at now is how to extend Fitz law to two dimensions, but we will also look at how Fitz law can be useful, or the concept behind it can be useful for other things in human computer interaction, and how we can use Fitz law to compare different input devices. So the original study by Paul Fitz, one apparatus that he used icon looked like this. So it consists of two metal bars here in black and a stylus, and the participants had to go with the stylus from one metal bar to the other. And all this movement only happened along one line, along one dimension. And so the size of the targets of the metal bars was only considered one dimension. So it didn't matter how high they are, it only mattered how wide they are. If you look at typical targets in human computer action, they are typically two-dimensional. An example is this button. And if you now want to learn about the size and the distance in order to apply Fitz law, we well could figure out what's the distance and what's the size here. And for this example, it's not very surprising. We just take the center of the button, and then we know the position of the pointer, and then we know the distance. And similarly, we can figure out what the size of the button is, and this is just well, the same principle, and then we just take how wide the button is. But if we now move the mouse pointer to another position, let's say we move it to the up, then again, we would like to know how far is the button away and what's the size of the button. And at least for the distance, it's not very difficult. We just take the center of the button again, and then we can figure out the distance. But what's the size of the button? Um, is it the same as before? And it's not, right? So what we have to do now is we draw a line from the pointer's position through the center of the target. And if you do that, then we can figure out like what's the portion where this line crosses the button. And this could then look like this. And this is our new size for the button. So we have the distance, and that's just as again, the position of the pointer and the center of the button. But now the size of the button is the length of this cross section. What that means is that depending on where the pointer is, the size of the targets can change. And for this one, it just became smaller. So if you want to predict how long it takes to select a button using Fitz law, we cannot only take the size and the distance into account, but we have to consider where the button is beforehand and where the mouse pointer is in order to figure out what is the actual size of the button. Well, if you want to do that, then we still need these constants a and b that form Fitz law or take uh, are part of Fitz law. One way of doing that is using metal bars and stylus and doing it just the way Paul Fitz did it. But typically in HCI, we don't use stylus and metal bars, but in graphical user interfaces, we typically have something like a mouse and a pointer on the screen but we can still use the same principle. So this is an example of an application by Scott McKenzie, and it resembles the original task. So this is a one-dimensional variation of a Fitz law task, and you have these two bars, a one in red, one in white, and the task for participants is now go from one of these bars to the other and back again and back again as fast as possible. And using this application, just as other application, we can then enter different variations of sizes and distances, and then all these variations are played through, and the application guides participants through this whole Fitz law experiment. So this for the one-dimensional case, but we can also use the two-dimensional version. So this is again from Scott McKenzie's application, and for the two-dimensional part, we arrange the targets in a circle. So we have a big circle and the big circle that defines the distance between the targets. And the smaller circles, these are the actual targets. So we use circles because for circles, it's 
the easiest to figure out how big they are, what their size is, because it doesn't matter where the pointer is. If you just draw a line through the circle to the center, then the size always stays the same. And again, we can have different variations of sizes and distances, but here it's the task changes constantly, but the distance and uh, size always stays the same. So we have um, the target the range in a circle, and then the task is go from one circle to the opposite side, but then don't go back to the original circle, the original target, but the one which is the next one. So thereby you go from each circle to another circle once, and if you finish the circle, then you go to the next trial or next combination of size and distance. So if you have that, then we can use it to figure out what are the device-specific constants. And that enables us to make predictions, but Fitz's law or the concept behind it enables more. One thing that we can think about is how can we decrease the time to select targets? And the most common targets are buttons or variations of buttons. And now we could think about, well, how can we decrease the time needed to select this button? And the simplest variation is we just increase the size of the button. The larger the button, the shorter the time to hit the target, because then the index of difficulty gets smaller. This is not always possible or not always recommended, because we also want to have a consistent size for all buttons. But there are certain applications where it actually makes sense to change the size of the button. An example are calculators. Just as a regular calculator, physical one, digital calculators all also change the size of the different keys. So an example is the equal sign, right? That is often larger than the other button on the calculator. And the reason is simply the equal button is hit or used so much more often that it actually makes sense to make it larger. And making it larger can be motivated by Fitz's law. So this is one way to enable users to select targets quicker. But there's another way. So we, now we change the size, but we can also change the distance. Think about context menus. So we have a mouse pointer and we press the right mouse button, and in a lot of applications, what happens is a context menu opens. And the context menu is not located somewhere on the screen, but it's located directly next to the mouse pointer. And by doing so, we bring the menu next to the pointer, and we decrease the distance between pointer and the targets, which are the menu items. So again, we increase the performance of users, and the context menu is different from like regular menus, which are typically located at the top of the window or at the top of the screen. For them, all the location always stays the same, and so the distance varies depending on where the mouse pointer is. But also for these cases, we can think about Fitz's law and increase users' performance. An example is macOS, Apple's operating system. For macOS, the menu is always located at the top of the screen. So it's not attached to the window and can be resized and arranged on the screen, but always stays for all applications at the top of the screen. And what happens here is that if you push the mouse hard against the top of the screen, it stays there. So you cannot cross the border of the screen. And because of that, the size or the virtual size of the menu items, things like the file or the edit menu, increases upwards. And because it increases upwards, because well, if you can push the mouse button in this direction and the mouse button wouldn't move, the size suddenly becomes virtually much bigger. And if we feed that into Fitz's law, we can figure out that the time to select these targets is much shorter because the index of difficulty is lower. Microsoft Windows does something related. If you look at the start menu, so this is an example from Windows 10, and you push the mouse and thereby the mouse pointer 
to the lower left corner, then the target of so this menu button in order to open up the start menu extends virtually in two dimensions. So it becomes very large in both dimensions. And this is because we can push the mouse as hard as we want into this corner. And if you push a bit harder to the left or to uh, the bottom, it doesn't really matter because well, it stops at the screen. This cannot really be modeled anymore with Fitz law, but this can be motivated by Fitz law. And for the individual application icons, well, then it's again very similar to macOS. They also extend in one dimension and they will become much easier to actually select. Fitz law can also be used, or the concept can be used to compare different input devices. This is an example by a study from Stuart Card and colleagues. And back in the days, they wonder which of these input devices is actually the best one. So they had the mouse, they had a joystick, different variations of keys to steer a pointer across the screen. And back in the days, it actually wasn't clear which one is the best pointing device. But the graphical user interface came up. And suddenly, a lot of people needed pointing devices. So they conducted a study motivated by Fitz law, very similar to what we saw from Scott McKenzie's applications. And Stuart Card's conclusion from that is that using Fitz law was a major factor leading to the mouse commercial success by Xerox. So introducing the mouse, the reason for that is that they could do a Fitz law experiment. And we might wonder, well, why is that really helpful? Because they had one metric in order to compare all kinds of input devices. It could be that one input device is better for certain types of targets and another one is better for another type of target. But Fitz Law tells us that this is actually not the case because the, there's a linear relationship between index of difficulty and movement time. Let's look at the more recent example. And in order to do that, we first have to look at yet another concept, which is called the throughput in this context. The throughput is a single metric that describes the performance of a user with an input device. There are different definitions for that, but they basically come to similar conclusions. One definition is the throughput equals the index of difficulty, so the average index of difficulty that you had in the study, divided by the average movement time for these index of difficulties. Another definition is the throughput equals one divided by B, one of the device specific constants. And these two definitions are the same if you assume that A is zero, which is typically not the case, but often A is very small and A is considered the startup time, and if you don't really, if you are not really interested in that, then these definitions come to the same conclusion. So let's look at an example where this has actually been done. But beforehand, we well, we look at this graph again in order to think about why is this actually useful. So what we could do if we have two different input devices, we could while test all kinds of different combinations of size and distance. And this would make sense only if we don't know about this linear relationship, because it could be that well, one input device is very good for targets that are very small, and the other one is good for targets which are very big. But as long as the index of difficulty stays the same, Fitz law tells us that, well, this is not the case. If the index of difficulty is the same, then the movement time should be the same as well. And that massively reduces the number of trials that we have to conduct because, well, it's sufficient to test around six index of difficulties to determine the device specific constants. And that's all we need in order to learn about the throughput. So six index of difficulties are enough to compare different input devices. Well, as I said, uh, there's still studies that use this principle. An example that's more recent is one by Scott McKenzie. So what Scott McKenzie and Tether did was they developed a new type of input device, a new pointing device for people with special needs. 
And the simple device works like this. You have a pointer on a tablet, and now you control the tablet not by touch, but through this pointer. And you move the pointer by moving the whole tablet. So if you move it to the right or the left, then the pointer moves accordingly. And this sounds a bit complicated or a bit difficult. And well, it actually is a bit difficult. So these are the traces of one participant. So this is an example of traces going from one target to the other. And as we can see, there's quite a variation. So there's not a straight line, but well, participants have a hard time to actually hit the target. But Scott McKenzie and Tether, they still want to figure out how useful is this input device. And they had two different variations. One was you hit a target or you select it by just crossing it. And the other variation was you have to stay on the target for a while. And this then typically called dwell time. And these two variations were used to conduct the Fitz law experiment. And what they figured out can be seen here in the graph. You see these two lines, uh, and the one in brown, that's the one with dwell time, and the one in blue is the one without dwell time. And well, the blue one, so the first entry method, that resulted in a lower task completion time, so a lower movement time. And accordingly, the throughput was also higher. And while the other one, the movement time was higher, and so the throughput was lower. And what they showed with this experiment is, on one hand, Fitz law still holds, so it works for these tasks and these input devices. But what they also showed is that one device or one variation of the input device is better for selecting targets than the other input device. Well, typically, we don't use tablets to steer pointers, we use other types of input devices. But we could still wonder um, what's the throughput for these devices, which one is the best? And we could wonder about things like the mouse or a touchpad. But we can also use things like uh, smartphones with touch screens. And for all these devices, we can determine the throughput. And well, if we have the throughput for multiple devices, we can use the throughput in order to say this device is better than another one. 